All right, this presentation, like all of our presentations this year, are made possible with support primarily from the Robert Schalkenbach Foundation and also from the Foundation for Economic Justice, the Henry George Institute, Common Ground USA, and um, private donors such as Sue Hansel and Polly Cleveland. We have uh, two panel or two presenters today. Um, Ted Gortney is going to do the primary presentation. Ted has uh, got a green screen that wasn't quite green enough, so he kind of disappears into the background a little bit. And Nick Tiedemann, uh, Ted is, let's see if I get this right, Ted has been an assessor for, for uh, quite some time was in charge of reassessing Southfield, Michigan, um, and in the process of reassessing, got just by making the land values right, because land values tend to be underassessed, Ted um, created a, a, a somewhat of an economic revitalization in Southfield because when the land assessments were right, the people holding on to that land let go of it. Uh, he went on to uh, reform the assessments of British Columbia, Canada, and um, then did some private bank appraisal work, I understand, and then uh, went and straightened out the assessments of Bridgeport, Connecticut, and then uh, Greenwich, Connecticut, and has retired after that. And my sense of it is Ted Gortney is the guy you hire when your assessments are screwed up and he comes in and fixes your assessments and sets it up so it will run well and then moves on to fix somebody else's assessments. But anyhow, Ted is, is by far our, our best expert on assessing. Nick Tiedemann is a professor at the university, is it Virginia Tech or? Oh, you're not, you're muted, but. Um, That's right. Yes, it's Virginia Tech. And or more co co formally, Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University. Okay. Um, yeah, I know they improved the name. I just used to call it Virginia Tech, and then they, they it, it was probably always Virginia Polytechnic, and, and then it went to become a state university as well. And I'm Dan Sullivan. I'm the president of the Council of Georgist Organizations. So what we're going to do, um, anybody who has a question, put it in Q&A. And when we get to question time, um, we will take questions from the Q&A. And uh, Ted will make his presentation. Then Nick will um, be a respondent. And then I will come back on to uh, open up for questions. So uh, go ahead, Ted. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dan. Um, I'm going to be using a PowerPoint uh, presentation uh, that I'm going to be uh, putting on the screen now so that you'll be able to uh, see what I'm talking about uh, as we go along. And I want to thank uh, Dan for the introduction and thank Nick for being a respondent on this session. And I welcome all of you to ask any questions uh, uh, at the end. I have a couple of sample questions and in case you need some hints, but I'm sure you'll come up with things. So I'm just going to start off by describing assessments first, and so you know what we're talking about. Uh, the role of the assessor is to estimate the market value of your property and to express it as an assessment. And now assessments were the basis of most municipal finance from the first half of the 20th century and even today represent a major share of the funding that's required uh, for municipal governments. So it is important that the, uh, that the assessments be kept current and that they be updated so that the, everyone has a, you know, a fair share of the burden of, 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 the, ta of the tax base. And each state has different standards and there are professional standards of both appraisers and assessors. Um, the state laws vary 
by state, and some of them require uh, certain discounts for farmland, or as others may not, and some of them have other provisions for how assessments are to be done. So the assessor has to follow those 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 rules. The whole the whole idea is that the assessor comes up with an, an impartial and non-political value. Uh, it's it's one that uh, th that is fair to everyone who's in the community that they live in, and it can't be a, a special, you know, for a group of property owners. It has to be fair for all property types and all people. To, to just begin with the fundamentals of assessment and what the assessor does is the assessor has the job of telling the public what they're doing, why they're doing it, and when they're going to complete it, when they're doing it. And they describe the scope of their work and, come, and the methods they're going to be using. They describe their analysis of sales and the models then that they develop. And finally, what the results are going to be in terms of tax changes in the community. And of course, to invite people to appeal their assessments if they're un un unhappy with them. Um, so there are three approaches to value. You've, I'm sure, all heard this before. Primary one is the market approach to value. That's based upon sales. Second is a cost approach to value. And the third is the income approach. I'm going to describe each of these three methods and then go into uh, a few examples. Um, first, the market value approach. The assessor uses the most recent market sales that are similar to the properties in terms of location and characteristics. The assessor does have a big advantage in that he gets all the assessment information and, and is able to then kind of categorize it and understand exactly the benefits that, that various property owners derive from the various property types in the community. And then he makes adjustments for differences between all the different property types. So that's the market approach. The second approach is the cost approach. And there, the assessor always begins by first estimating the land as though it's vacant without any improvements on it. And I'll discuss how that's done later. Then they estimate the replacement cost, how, mu how much would cost to replace the building, then to how much the depreciation sh should be, including any deterioration and obsolescence. And then the third approach that's used, and this is used primarily for income property, is the income approach for commercial properties. And in that case, the market value is equal to the net income divided by the capitalization rate. And I'll explain this in a little bit more detail also, but the capitalization rate is, is basically a little bit different than an interest rate. It's a real estate rate, and I can show you how that's calculated also. The methods that are used to value real estate are, first of all, the assessor develops his database. He studies the comparable, and by the database, I mean all the characteristics the property has. On a typical property, we may have like a thousand different items that are there, like a fireplace and, and a swimming pool and all the sizes of rooms and so forth. So they develop a database, and this database then is used all along, but it's corrected as time goes on. The assessor then studies the comparable sales so that he's able to see what values people put on for the different features based upon the comparable sales. And based on that, they develop valuation models. And once the valuation models have been uh, uh, proven, they apply the models to all the property. So I'm going to start off and talk about land first, because land is the most important part of any assessment that's made by an assessor. Uh, the reason that it's important is that basic fundamental uh, uh, um, requirement in making any appraisal is that land be assessed first and be valued first, and that any buildings that are built are, are kind of what's the remainder, the residual of what's left over after the land value is determined. So the assessor always begins his job by, va by valuing the land. 
And in doing that, he usually divides the city up into neighborhoods where there's you know, common characteristics. And this is kind of based upon the locations in town. And in looking at land, the size of the lot is very important. The special features are very important. Any views or any street outlooks and so forth are very important. And the location next to highways and railroads, and ponds, ocean, parks, amenities, are all characteristics that give value to land. So anything else that has either a positive or a negative influence on land value is, is considered in value in the land. Now most assessors use parcel maps. In many assessing jurisdiction, the assessor's job is to actually produce the parcel map Either that or uses the planning department parcel map. But this enables them to kind of show then how the parcel relates in terms to other properties, in terms of its size, its location, and then its shape and so forth. So the assessor starts with the parcel map. He then divides his properties up into neighborhoods. In this case, there's about 60 different neighborhoods that have different colors. And these neighborhoods are based upon similar characteristics that houses may have, for example, and conforming market values, where it's typical to have a value in a certain neighborhood of X, maybe 100,000 or whatever. And so this is kind of found as, as a standard for a neighborhood. By, by dividing properties up into neighborhoods, he's then able to study all the individual properties within the neighborhood but start with a basis so that he's able to kind of equalize fairly to all the people that are, that are within that similar neighborhood. The next thing is the production of land value maps. And in this case, this shows the advantage of location. Now to the south of the map is the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and to the north are hills and mountains. So the most valuable properties are those to the south by the ocean. And the ones of lesser value are the, the more residential to the north. And you can see the uh, on the side there, I've colored it and shown how much per, uh, per square foot the lands are worth. <clears throat> You'll see some of them that are big pieces that are yellow. Well, the most parts, those are unsubdivided parcels. Usually they're parks or properties that are owned by the city or by the jurisdiction. They have kind of the lowest value because to be used, uh, they, they have to be subdivided and have a lot of value added to them in terms of improvements. Uh, the lighter green ones are kind of the, the, the houses, the, the land, land parcels that are furthest away from the civic center there. And then as, as you come towards the civic center and towards the south, <coughs> the green gets darker and darker. And then it gets into those blues. So those are kind of the more valuable properties that are in the city. I've included both uh, residential and commercial land, but most of the commercial is in that purple area, right towards the center, on, near the ocean on the center. And you can actually see the five freeway going through, the, uh, uh, through, the, through the, this particular town. This is the town of Greenwich that this map represents. So on doing the land value, the assessor studies all sales that have occurred. He looks at the improved sales, the vacant land sales, teardown sales, and land residual sales. By teardown sales, we mean that there may be a old house or an old business property. The whole reason it was bought was not to improve it or use it, but it was to tear it down and to use it as a new site for a new house or for a new commercial development. So teardown tear down sales are particularly valuable because they're pure land value and in assessing, we add on to that, that sale the cost of demolishing the building. If it costs typically $10,000 to de demolish it and they paid 90,000, that would indicate a land sale of $100,000. Vacant land sales are of course obvious they're, they're pure land sales, they're the best. And then we have improved sales and, and doing analysis of land value, we always do a land residual analysis of every sale that's occurred. We subtract from the sale the, the value of 
the, um, the buildings, the depreciated buildings that are on the property. So that gives us um, such a large number of land sales that we're able then to come up with a very tight and accurate value of land. And that's the way that, that land is generally valued by assessors. Second then to talk about are the home assessments. <clears throat> and looking at homes, there's a lot of things the assessor continues, but just a few in particular are the size of the house with its characteristics, the type and style of the, uh, of the house, the number of bathrooms and bedrooms that it has, fireplaces, special features, the condition and age of the house, and in particular, any additions or remodeling that's done. Um, any outbuildings, garages, swimming pools, etc. These are all things that kind of create more value in one house compared to another house. So in comparing from uh, sales that have occurred of houses, you have to consider all these differences. You may have a subdivider that went in and built houses that were all very similar, but then people come in and they put additions on it, they do remodeling, they make major changes, and those are the things that change the value of the houses as they go along. Based upon this analysis, the assessor then develops a valuation model, and the sales predict the importance that the purchasers, purchasers place on the property features, uh, <clears throat> starting with land based upon the location, the size, the allowed use, and the buildings that are there, including the size, quality, condition, and features of the buildings. All right, so we've covered residential, then commercial is next that has to be valued. And in commercial buildings, uh, the important features are the size of the building, condition of the building, any additions or remodeling. The locational value, of course, is the primary thing because on commercial buildings, people are paying for the buildings that offer them the most advantages in terms of peop, foot traffic and people getting to it. So those, those that are close to the train station, for example, have a much higher value than ones that are further away. And then the other thing that we look at is the income and expense data from the property. And I'll go over that in a minute. Um, <clears throat> commercial valuation is, uses all three approaches to value. It, it leans heavily on the sales market approach. It leans also on the cost approach, especially when there's differences that can be costed out. And it also deals primarily on the income approach because that shows what people are willing to pay for the best locations and the advantages they get. And just to kind of summarize the income approach, we looked at the gross income from the property that would, be tip, that would be typical, not what is actual by the owner, but what would be typical for that kind of property in that location. Sometimes the property owners are not getting as much as they should be getting, but you always value the property on its highest and best use. And then you subtract the average vacancy. Now, of course, the owner may not have any vacancy, but over a period of time, there is vacancy, so you take that out. And then you take out typical expenses, not actual expenses, but what expenses would be typical uh, but, but for owners to have. This then gives, gives you a net income that you divide by a capitalization rate, which is a land capitalization rate or a, a improved property capitalization rate. Next, you verify the data. Uh, and the assessor and owner have to make sure that the data on each property is correct. Uh, assessors usually put out a homeowner and business questionnaire where they ask the, the pro all the property owners to display the information about their properties. And we're very happy if we get back even 75% of those questionnaires. It gives us enough information to then really be aware of what's happening. Uh, and then we ask people to visit the office uh, especially during a revaluation, look at their field cards and to look for errors so that they can be corrected. And that's the, the primary thing is we do ask the assessors to visit the assessor's office, the, the, the property owners to visit the uh, appraiser's office. Then we test our valuation models. Um, we test it by sales statistics and uh, we want to be sure that we are giving the right 
information for the, for the characteristics that we have about the property and that we correct us any assessment errors. The models determine the data elements that are important in determining market value and the modeling techniques are used to meet the professional standards and the state standards. Then we apply the models. We apply the models to all properties. There are different models for commercial and different models for residential and sometimes different models for residential by neighborhood. Then we test the results against the new sales that occur in doing a revaluation, for example, it might take a year or two to complete it. So we're looking at those sales that come up right at the end of the revaluation period. And that tests the validity of the models that we had. And we hope that we are able to predict very closely what the assessment is compared to what the sale is. Then we send the notices out to all the property owners at that point. And we ask at that point that be sure that the data is correct and that the assessor's office is asked to correct any errors and that the uh, appraisers are available to explain the valuation methods and the models to the property owners and it's possible to have a hearing with the Board of Assessment Appeals if there are still questions. So the grounds for an appeal is the value is inaccurate or unfair. The data that the, the, they need to correct the data still on your property. That you want to look, they want to look at comparables and see if the comparables justify the assessment, and then look at other people's assessment and see whether they're fair. In, re, in revaluing property, this is San Francisco. You basically can see that um, you've got all kinds of property to do, all kinds of commercial all kinds of residential, and all kinds of mixture of properties. So it's very important that you come up with models that make sense for all the properties uh, that are in your jurisdiction. And the goal of a revaluation is to update all real property to the same valuation date, to correct any errors and discover changes, to ensure fairness and equity in assessment, uh, to equalize all assessments to a standard level and that level is market value. Now why do values change? Well, and the reason that revaluations have to be done, hopefully every year, but at least every three or four years, if not every year, things change as time goes on. Um, things are added uh, uh, to properties, uh, people add bathrooms on or whatever. Some properties get damaged by floods or earthquakes. Sometimes uses changed. What used to be a residential or an apartment area is changing from an apartment to a condominium. Or a major industry leaves town or a new one comes into town. Or inexpensive homes are not available so that prices go up on all homes. And recession, a recession can also reduce demand. So these are the reasons why values change. Cities have revenue needs, so this is how a city calculates what the tax rate is for the city. And very simply, they look at the revenue that's needed, in this case, 300 million, and they look at the total assessed values, which is 35 billion, and you divide the revenue needed by the total assessment base, and you come up with a percentage tax rate. In this case, it's 00857 which would equate, equate to $8.57 per thousand dollars of assessment. It's a simple formula, uh, so anyone can figure it out. Uh, and, and I know that Steve Cord, when he was initially dealing with people, he had to explain this to people that didn't really understand the simple calculation. So why do taxes change? Um, not only do properties change, but the, the needs in the community change. There are sometimes needs for more funding for community improvements that are required. Sometimes on a revaluation, um, if all the assessments increase, the rates may fall, or if all the assessments decrease, the rates may increase. That's the end. Basically, I thank you for your attention, and at this point, we'll take questions. Scott Baker wants to know, what is the difference between an assessor and appraiser? Well, 
in essence, they're really both the same. The only difference is that an assessor has the job of doing a fair assessment or appraisal of all the properties within the jurisdiction that fit within the uh, state and local laws and requirements. And sometimes the assessor's job is to follow laws that may be a little bit different than what an appraiser is doing. However, theoretically, they are the same. The appraiser and the assessor should always come up with really the same value and point out any differences that may be brought about by laws. Yeah. I always had the sense that the assessors are kind of like wholesale appraisers because they're appraising all the properties at once yeah. and they, they can be go in greater depth because the data they're gathering applies to a large number of properties rather than an appraiser is appra he's, he's paid by the individual property owner to a, Appraise that one individual property. Yeah, we yeah. often had we often had uh, appraisers coming into the assessor's office, and uh, just to pick up information that they knew that we had, and we would exchange information with them. And once in a while, they'd even point out things to us that we weren't aware of, you know, about a community change or whatever. Okay, Scott wanted to know how the capitalization rate is calculated. Okay, and the, I had a question about that as well. Okay. The capitalization rate basically is looking at what the typical net income is divided by the, the value, the market value of the property. If you divide the income by the property value, you come up with a capitalization rate. Now, in doing a capitalization rate and in doing assessments, you're always looking at what is typical. Uh, not what is actual, but you know what typically would be the the net income and what typically would be um, the market value and what typically then would be the capitalization rate. But uh, it's again a very simple thing to do. Now it does vary always from the interest rate, and you find out that sometimes in commercial properties you could have um, much higher rates than you would have perhaps on a um, on an interest rate based because of risk and other factors that are built into that analysis of income and market value. I always thought that you were capitalizing not the rent you're getting now, but the rent you anticipate getting over the next 20 years or so. So if you're in a Correct. neighborhood that's gentrifying, the, the capitalization rate might be higher than the current rentals. But if you're in a neighborhood that's declining, the capitalization rate might be lower than the you know, the capitalization rate might be capitalizing lower rentals because you're looking at a neighborhood that's going downhill. Um, so you give Nick a chance to talk now. Yeah, we'll come back to the questions in a bit. Nick? Okay. Uh, I think I'd like to begin, Dan, by correcting something that you just said. Okay. Uh, if you have... So a neighborhood that is rising in value, the capitalization rate will be low because uh, it, you, you will get, be getting a return in capital gains. And so therefore you don't need to get it in the, re, in the return. Similarly, if you have a neighborhood that's declining in value, you need a high capitalization to make it worth, worthwhile. So the capitalization rate goes in the opposite direction of the growth of value. Anyway, but getting back to my comments on Ted. What I would say is that Ted is a competent and honest appraiser, assessor, or he was when he was working. And he told, it, told us how it goes when it goes right. And so in responding, I'm going to say some things about how it goes when it goes wrong. Uh, what can go wrong? Well, first you can have assessors who are incompetent or corrupt or both, which does happen. Uh, and you can also have political interference. Uh, Ted experienced this when he was assessor in Hartford. He came up with a wonderful set of assessments, but it meant that poor people would pay less and rich people would pay more. And so the administration put them, wouldn't put them into effect. Uh, so when things like that happen, well, uh, Ted couldn't do anything about it. If, uh, even worse than that, Nick, it was the 
black people that lived in the north area and the white people that lived in the south area that tended to be richer. So it was not mm. only a, a wealth <laughs> thing, but it was also a racial thing. Yes. And it caused me to quit. I just I, yeah. I went to British Columbia at that point. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, and there's a temptation that assessors are uh, subject to, which is called burying your mistakes and under assessment. Uh, people don't necessarily know what the average uh, ratio is of assessed value to market value. If, if your property is uh, assessed at 80% of the value, you think you might get, be getting a wonderful deal. But if everybody else is assessed at 6%, you're getting a poor deal. Uh, so you just don't have as many complaints if you underassess. Uh, and so th there's a tendency for assessors who are lazy or less competent, perhaps, to figure they can get away with more, they wouldn't have to work as hard, their mistakes won't be noticed as much if they underassess. Uh, another phenomenon that arises is the squeaky wheel phenomenon. Uh, assessors recognize that some people are going to complain and other people won't, and so they have the uh, appeal process where everybody who complains can get an adjustment and everybody else uh, just wasn't uh, concerned enough to complain and so they have to live with whatever they, they get. So you, you have a distortion in favor of people who complain. Now, uh, one of the reasons that assessment is subject to such difficulties is because it's fundamentally a difficult thing to do and it has inherent difficulties arising from the fact that prices aren't stable. They're volatile. Uh, the market prices go up and down and individual sales prices uh, differ from the market. Uh, some sellers are ignorant and put their property for sale at a low price and sell it immediately when they could get more. Uh, some need to sell it immediately, and so they offer it at a low par price, even though if they could get more if they were willing to wait. And then we have people like uh, the owner of a lot up the street from me. She uh, received it as a gift from her parents who own the house next door, and she has it for sale at a price that's about two times what it's worth, and she's had it at that price for 10 years. She figures that somebody will come along from New York who doesn't know how low the other prices are and they'll buy it. And she's just prepared to wait indefinitely until such a person comes along. So if she ever does manage to sell, it won't be that I could sell uh, my lot if it were vacant for the same price. It's just that if you're willing to wait long enough, you can get a higher price than other people get. Uh, <clears throat> then yet another thing is that Sometimes assembly efforts are occurring. Somebody putting, trying to put together a lot of contiguous properties in order to make a major redevelopment. And uh, that will cause prices to go up. Uh, if there's some chance that it'll go through, you, you might, if you are one of the last people to agree, you can expect to get a higher price. If it then becomes apparent that it's not going to go through, the prices will fall again. Yet another tricky thing is zoning. Uh, what a lot is worth depends not only on what you're allowed to do with it, what, but also on what you might be allowed to do with it if you got a zoning exception. And so there'll be cases where somebody will say, you've overassessed my lot. I couldn't possibly get, uh, it couldn't possibly be worth that much because I'm not allowed to do with it what, uh, I would need to do with in order to make that value. And the proper reply is, yes, we know that, but we also know that the uh, zoning board is uh, easy to persuade. And so you, all you have to do is uh, go to the zoning board and ask for a, an exception and you get it. And that is built into the market value of your land. Uh, whether the uh, assessor or the owner wins that will vary from time to time. Yet another 
perspective on this difficulty is that it isn't even clear what we mean by value. I believe that the standard in appraising and assessing is put in words like what a uh, buyer who wasn't urgent to buy would pay to a seller who wasn't urgent to sell or something like that. Uh, but it's also interesting to ask, well, philosophically, what do we mean by value? And here uh, in the arcane word, world of economists, where we imagine having information that we never actually will have, there are two competing conceptions of value. One is that value is what something is worth to the person to whom it's worth the most. And the other is that value is what is worth to the person to whom it's worth the second most. So the value of my house isn't what it's worth to me. It's what I could sell it for if I didn't want it. The, the, what I'm, the value that I'm depriving somebody else of by keeping it for myself. Uh, so all these things uh, make it hard to specify precisely what it is to do a assessor's job well. Uh, Another interesting aspect of it that I did, don't think I heard Ted say is that uh, land is probably easier to assess in buildings because land tends to be a continuous function of location apart from zoning. Uh, if you're going to get a building right, you would have to know exactly what the level of maintenance and decay is. And, uh, or special improvement is. And you never can really know all the ins and outs of that. Whereas uh, a piece of land, you know exactly where it is. And it's uh, almost identical to the piece beside it. And the land value function is a continuous function of location. Then one final thing I would say is that because assessment is so important, uh, it would be a good idea if citizens paid more attention to it and paid attention to statistical studies. Uh, because we don't expect assessors to predict sales perfectly, uh, we can't judge them by the fact that they don't get all the sales right. And yet, if an assessor is doing a good job, there will be less variation in the ratio of selling price to assessed value than if the assessor is doing a poor job. And it's very important to keep a track of those uh, statistics. That's the end of my comments. I want to thank Nick. Uh, excellent response to my, my talk. And I think what's been really valuable is you've kind of seen what really happens in the assessing world. And Nick has really brought that out. And uh, it's not an easy job. I'll say that right now because you're dealing with a multiple of opinions of what is market value and, and what are the characteristics and the judgment. And largely assessing is largely a judgment type thing. And you're proving your judgment and you're trying to back up your judgment with, with sales. So that you're saying, well, I'm basing my judgment on this sale or this set of sales. Uh, and it is very difficult dealing with the public and having these revaluations. You deal with virtually everyone in the city and they come in with all kinds of different problems and different ideas. And uh, uh, Nick has done a wonderful job of presenting what the real world of assessment is. Thank you, Nick. I wanted to mention that uh, our assessment database has some data on the nature of the sale itself. So if it's an estate, estate sale, that's flagged. And my understanding is that the assessors assume that the state sale, estate sales on the average are about 25 to 30% less than, than uh, direct owner sales tend to be. That a, a living owner who's going to buy another house is likely to hold out for more money, but his kids really don't want to deal with it. So estate sales tend to be um, lower. I, did not, I do not recall seeing data for out-of-town buyers because out-of-town buyers tend to pay more, especially if they just got a job in town and they need a place 
and they don't have the luxury that, you know, when I lived in Pittsburgh and was renting for a long time, I could spend several years looking for a good deal, but people coming in from out of town cannot. I don't know that, that they um, tabulate the things, the, that they don't assess the nature of the sale itself as much as they could. Um, so I, I wanted to note that highest best use is just means the full market use. It doesn't, it, it's, to, it's to distinguish from an interim use or, or an obsolete use. So, you know, something that was the highest best use when the building was new is not the highest best use anymore. But also somebody who has a parking lot or throws up a small building and it's just, it's a, it's a taxpayer. He, it's, it's the best use as an interim use because it doesn't make sense to build something permanent if you're going to tear it down and build something bigger in 10 years. But it's not the, the highest, it's not the highest use because it's a use that you're doing for the moment. I'd like to comment on an aspect of that. Uh, if it has been announced that a subway line is going to be uh, extended and a stop is going to occur at a particular place and it's going to be finished in five years, then for the next five years, you don't want to do very much with it, but you want to have a finished high rise in place the day the subway stop opens. So that's an example of a situation where the highest and best use may be a vegetable garden for a few years. Yeah, and, and I, use, I use the airport example because airports tend to be out in farmland when they're first built. Yeah. And it, it makes sense to keep it a farm. But when the airport opens, it, that land will probably be hotels or something. Mm. Um, it strikes me that political problems, that the, technolo the technology of assessing is not that difficult compared to the politics of assessing. Um, no. and, um, and I wanted to ask about, a, um, Maryland had a program, because uh, I've seen people try to cap assessments, which just makes them worse and worse. And Pennsylvania struck down assessment caps. Mm -hmm. But Maryland has a, a system called assessment buffering. So if there's a reassessment and your property value jumps, they have, my understanding is that they give you a third of the increase plus 10%, which means that even if your property continues to grow, that that buffered assessment will catch up fairly quickly to the full assessment and you won't get that terrible shock. And, uh, I don't think that's perfect justice, but it's better the justice than people being afraid to reassess because they don't. There are, there are now buffering in many, many states in the United States and California in particular with Proposition 13. The assessments of properties in a neighborhood can be totally different based upon the year that they were bought in because the, frozen, the assessment gets frozen with only a 2% per year increase. So this is a major political problem that you have uh, nationwide now and why uh, many states are looking at other forms of taxation to collect what used to be revenue derived from the property tax now that the property tax has been buffered or limited. Uh, John Beck wants to know, um, if allowed use is the same, why should the value of an apartment building be different if whether it's rentals or condos? And maybe that's also split that into land and buildings that the land value should be the same. But what do you say about it? Well, a, a, a condo is being sold to one individual, whereas an apartment is a former, is, is a type of ownership of multiple units, maybe 50 units in a building. And what, what happened a lot here 10 years ago before we had our big crash is you had people buying apartments and converting them to condos and making a fortune on the change. Now, uh, this is because of the fact that the ownership has changed from one person having 50 to individuals owning just and buying just one unit at a small fraction of that price. So they're able to get a much higher price. Um, I agree with you that the land basically shouldn't really be any different. 
because land is land, and if you can build uh, on it, you uh, you know you want to you could build either with. They're going to look very similar. Yeah. I would say that the difference in the, the value of the building shouldn't be greater than the cost of conversion. Now, I think to some extent there will be a tendency of assessors uh, to say that the uh, apartments aren't worth as much uh, because the uh, apartment dwellers uh, are poor and there's some tendency to be uh, considerate or compassionate toward poor people and not to want to charge them as much. But in principle, the value of the building uh, in condos and the value of the apartments next door if they're identical buildings uh, shouldn't be different, different by more than the legal cost of making the conversion from one form to the other. Strikes me that condos, condos are more expensive because you're buying individual units. It's like the same reason that when you buy a bottle of, of soda or a bottle of beer, it costs more than, per bottle than when you buy a case of beer or a case of soda. So that uh, it's, it's the transaction becomes much more of a, a tiny retail micro transaction rather than a, you know, when you're selling an apartment building, you're selling the whole building. And so there's, there's that differential, but I don't know how that, if we were on a land value tax, if the land is the same, then, then the condo owners would not be penalized. Yes, definitely, if we, we were under land value taxation, the land should have the same value. And whether uh, the building should have this, the sum of the values the same in both cases is a, uh, I think, a subtle philosophical question as to what we mean by value. Uh, I suppose that you could say that if experientially the condos sell individually for a price which when multiplied by the number is greater than the value at which you see comparable apartments change hands, then you could say, well, uh, the market reveals that the, the condos are worth more, but that should also mean that uh, additional apartment owners uh, are losing out on the opportunity to make a profit by converting from apartments to condos. Josh Vincent um, says, how reactive are values to externalities such as COVID-19 or the quarantine, I assume, or a conflagrations, maybe such as the looting that recently occurred? Um, are property taxes more stable than other taxes in times of distress? Um, it's a very interesting question. Um, I, I'm just noticing, and, and, and I think it may depend upon different markets in different places, but I think here in Orange County, where I live, we have not seen any loss in value at all We've actually seen values c continuing up. We had a drop in sales for a two month period, but the sales prices didn't go down in that two months. Now I'm sure that if we found another location somewhere else where everyone got sick and everyone moved out of town or something, <laughs> the values would go down, yes. Uh, but I think it, it, you have to look at it in, in each case. Uh, that's always true in assessment. You always have to kind of group together things that are similar uh, or characteristics that are similar. Uh, but I, I, I guess from my view, I don't see there for a while. I thought there'd be a, a chance, you know, to get a house at a real bargain, you know, if you, if you had kids looking for one. But I, I don't see that happening, uh, at least here where we live. I'm guessing he's asking for a comparison to other taxes, too. So if 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 wage earners leave your municipality, your wage tax revenue will go down. Yeah. If businesses leave, your sales tax revenue will go down. Yeah. And then the question is, do your property values go down? As you know, is it, are you more vulnerable to losing property value than you are to losing sales tax revenue or wage tax revenue? And one is this. 
in the United States, our, our, our property taxes are so low that, um, you know, they're usually less than 1%. Very few states have them going up to 3 or 4%. It, it's so low in terms of the burden of taxes that it really doesn't have that big of an impact on reducing values. The, of course, the advantage of the property tax is those taxes will are due and will be collected, mm -hmm. whereas the sales taxes just don't appear because people are not buying. They may buy later to make up for what they didn't buy, but for the period of time, maybe six months or a year, sales taxes could decline greatly, and so could income taxes uh, decline. Another factor that arises here is that very few assessors are so much on the ball that they're going to reduce the assessments uh, when the market changes. And so for at least a while, maybe a, a year or two, the uh, revenue will continue because the bills will be sent out according to the old assessments. Uh, eventually there may be some uh, cries from the property owners that will get the assessments to change or the tax rate to change. But the the practice of, well, the way it used to be is the uh, county would say, how much money do we need? What's the assessed value? Uh, divide one by the other and we get the tax rate, send out the bills. And so you just didn't have an expectation that the tax rate that would necessarily be the same from one year to the next and you collected whatever you needed. I can give you, give you a real example in uh, Bridgeport where I was the assessor. <coughs> we had a requirement to do a revaluation every five years. So I did one in 2005 and one in 2010. And in 2005, the values increased just dramatically by more than 20%. But then in 2010, they dropped dramatically by 20%. So we had that enormous change from one period to the other. Uh, the, the net effect is it kind of went back to where it had been. But we were able to manage that. And that's true now, you know, that, that uh, crisis occurred over many years there, 2005, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Um, and so people were probably... Whoops, you froze. Uh, it was last, yeah. in that last year, you know, 2008. Yeah, the, uh, the thing I try to get across to people is if everybody's property value rises, your share of the tax load is the same. It's only if yours yeah. rises more than other people's rise. Yeah. And exactly. usually, usually they do rise unevenly, which is why it's the people in the richer neighborhoods who get upset when there's a reassessment because the people in the richer neighborhoods, for one thing, they bought in those neighborhoods because they could afford to say, I'm gonna find a neighborhood that's gonna go up in value. Where the people, yeah. where poorer people w just, just wanna know if they can make the payments. If they can make the payments, that's all there is to it. If it's a declining neighborhood, it's still what they could afford. Um, I have two questions from the same person. One, one is what is the best way to assure a title holder's assessment is accurate? Land value maps seem to be the most useful. And the other one was what is the typical cost of grievances to a municipality? How can they best be reduced? Well, the, the typical cost of grievances uh, is typically, it may reduce values by a, a modest amount, but not a large amount. And in terms of the property owners, um, um, you know, it, it, it would make some change in the property taxes they, pay, they, they take. I but I think, I think a town builds in a grievance factor when they set their mill rate. They factor in like 1% drop due to grievances so that's already built in when they set their mill rate about what they're expecting to happen. I guess grievances means appeals? Yeah. More or less? Re reductions due to appeals. Okay. And um, to assure the title holder's assessment is accurate. Um, yeah, that's pretty much what you went through is the, is in the whole presentation. Um, yeah, well, if you you know, it, you look at the map and you be sure that the size is right. To, you know, they, they 
the, the people come in typically to an assessor's office to verify data. And uh, they, they want to check it up just to be sure that what they're getting, that they're getting the right information about it. So they, they come in and look at the assessment maps and they raise questions and they raise questions about the zoning and the use of the property and so forth. And this is typically done when people are, are changing title and want to be assured that what they're getting is what they're bargaining for. I'm assuming computer assistant mass appraisal um, is works better for land. I always thought you could assess buildings less often than you assess land. Theoretically, every time there's a transaction, your computer could do a micro adjustment to land values. Um, in Pennsylvania, it's, you're required to assess the land and buildings periodically, at, at, and it has to be the same for both. And it struck me that the building value could be re reassessed less often, although it would still be reassessed if there's a fire or a new new construction. Or, you know, if there was something that destroyed value or created new value, that you could still assess that. But I was wondering if we were under straight land value tax, how much of the buildings have to be assessed at all, and how often? Well, uh, let me reply to that. Uh, a couple of years ago, I published a paper that talked about the way the changes in the value of land affect the value in buildings. Uh, the extreme example is uh, the garden apartment beside the place where you're putting in a, uh, a subway stop. The arrival of the subway stop turns the garden apartment into garbage. Uh, it's time to tear it down and put in something else. So even though it's, it hasn't deteriorated at all, it's obsolete. Uh, the more general version of that is that whenever land value changes, the optimal use of the land changes. And so whatever the building you have there uh, was probably built for a different value of land and becomes worth less because it's no longer suited to the land that's there. So it turns out that uh, if you do it exactly right, uh, every time the land value changes, the building value changes too, in the op generally in the opposite direction. Okay. Um, Elena wants to know, Ted, if you're going to discuss the advantage of a land value only property tax, in which case do you think that the full land rent should be collected and distribute some of that to individuals um, on a per capita basis for their fair share of land rent. After removing taxes on buildings, what other taxes would you put, make next to be removed? Well, I'll just say yes, yes, and yes to the question. Uh, cer <laughs> certainly, I believe as an assessor that we should collect 100% of the land rental value of a property. Now, the land rental property the value of a land rental property is very easy to calculate and should be calculated annually without any problem at all, especially with the use of computers. It just takes no time and no cost at all. Now, the reason that we take all of the land value is for the simple reason that it belongs to all people. As it's not something that, that uh, belongs to the title holder of the property. It's what belongs to all people. And a title holder should have to pay uh, for the for the exclusive use of the property that he's going to build buildings on, that he's going to extract income from. Uh, in all in all the work I've done, I've never found a situation where there's not a surplus of revenue being available than is being needed by the government. There's always a surplus. Like I, I found out in most cases, the surplus could be as much as 50% more revenue that's there from a land value tax than is needed to fund the government. So what do you do with that 50%? Um, well, I think I'd look first at being sure that the community has all the improvements that's needed and that they're in good shape and so forth. But then it would make sense to give a citizen's dividend or a rebate to all the people in that community uh, of the surplus money that is collected from a land value tax. Um, I believe this sincerely, and I believe it would be a, a large amount. I know that even on the Schockenbach Foundation, we were talking about a small dividend of $1,000 a month would be very, very easy to, uh, to distribute and to collect. 
And um, I think that the dividend could be much higher than that. And I think that it's only fair to give back a dividend to all the people. And I know that argu the argument that Nick will probably make is that this is a problem not of just a local jurisdiction, but it's a worldwide problem because we do have to consider all people that have a right to live on the earth. Uh, to elaborate on that, I like to distinguish between the component of land value that arises from nature and the component of land value that arises from uh, infrastructure and social institutions. And so in my view, we have an obligation to share on a global basis the part that arises from nature, but we have a reasonable claim to share internally uh, in a country the part that arises from the value of our institutions and the infrastructure that we put in, as well as the private development and its effect on land value. I, um, I like the, the I, I'm more of an incrementalist, so my question is always what to do first, because you're, you're gonna gradually make this transition. And my, my usual answer to people is I would, the first taxes I would get, the first government charges I would get rid of are the deed transfer tax and the building permit fee. Because when you shift from building tax to land tax, you're saying, we do not want you to sit mm -hmm. on this property anymore. We're gonna punish you for sitting on this underdeveloped property. So we're we should at least remove the punishment for letting go of the property and remove the punishment for building the property. So you, you, get, no, you get no building permit fees or you just get a deposit and when you pass inspection, you get your money back. And if you sell it, you get no tax on that. And I have a different answer to what to do first. An answer that's been coming to me for the past few years. And that is that we have to get people used to the idea that land is everyone's uh, common inheritance. And so what I think what we need to do is to popularize the generalization of the idea of being uh, carbon neutral. And I call it being resource proportional. We need to get people into the habit of calculating how much more than their share they are taking and then distributing the surplus to those who have the least. So that people who want to think of themselves as uh, being in right relationship with the world would not ask it whether they're being carbon neutral, or whether they're being resource proportional. In terms of other taxes, I think the sales tax is one that is so detrimental, I think, to the consumption of goods and production of goods. And I think also the wage taxes are just crazy, you know. Um, like I could live with it, with a big tax on corporations, but I have a hard time living with taxes on individuals who work an hourly job and, uh, and, and, and have so little, you know, so much taken from them. We're, we're kind of drifting into the policymaker's <laughs> role rather than the assessor's role. Um, Getting back to assessing, uh, Ed Dodson said, uh, at, without a physical inspection, how does an assessor determine the degree to which a building has depreciated? Well, a, a, a physical inspection, of course, is the, is the best way of, of doing it. But it's amazing what assessors can learn in, in drive-bys and walk-bys about a property, you can kind of tell you know, just by walking by a property, whether or not it's been maintained and improved or whether it's falling apart. And I think that that's, that's one way. The other way is on our questionnaire, uh, asking people about what kinds of improvements they've made and what they're doing to maintain their property. And I, so I think that there are other ways, but, the, but certainly the best way is to do an interior inspection. And that's why you know, every five years, it would be a nice thing to, to be able to do that, but that takes a lot of money. So most jurisdictions are kind of tending away from that and doing more by uh, field inspection by drive-bys. We don't allow interior for residential properties without the homeowner's invitation, but I, I don't know about commercial properties. Commercial properties, to the degree that they're open to the public, are also open to the, to the assessor, I would think. Mm -hmm. um, 
uh, a resident won't tell you about the marble fireplace he put in, but he will tell you if his foundation is cracked. Right. <laughs> right. So, um, when Acton, Ackenbaum wants to know how does it work for commercial property that is owner occupied? Well, of course, most commercial property is owner occupied. So we're talking, we're talking about a lot of properties, and in that case, we're always looking at what the the income from the highest and best use, what the income from that property would generate. And then we're still looking at the typical vacancy that that property would generate. And then we're looking at what the typical expenses would be. So we do an income approach on a property that's owner occupied. And it has, and when we do one on any, any income property, it's not so much that we care about exactly what the tenant is paying and so forth is what should they be paying? What would the far, fair market rent be for either an owner occupied or a leased property? And we look at always then averages and we're able to pretty well sell this to the commercial community because we, we actually build charts and we build formulas and so forth and we invite them to look at it. And for the most part, they, they get sold on the ideas that, well, this is a fair way of doing it. But we always also use a market approach on the commercial properties and we, we look at sales of commercial properties and uh, we do a cost approach in terms of depreciating the improvements and coming up with a value through a cost approach. Um, Lee Hatchadorian says neighborhoods are rarely officially defined and real estate people are often trying to mint new neighborhoods. When you say that residential housing is assessed by neighborhood, how are those neighborhoods typically defined how do you handle fuzziness in neighborhood boundaries or properties that are close to a boundary and less likely to be influenced by the land value of the neighboring neighborhood? That's a, that's a good question. I think the assessor attempts to come up with his best ideas about what a neighborhood is. And it's a, it's a, it's a group of similar properties that have similar characteristics that have similar kind of market values and so forth. And sometimes we get our neighborhoods challenged, often we do, saying that, well, this is really a sub-neighborhood of this other neighborhood. And sometimes uh, it's very difficult to say, well, where that line goes. You know, most neighborhoods are divided by streams or by highways or by railroads or something, mountains that are there that, that help you kind of define it. But sometimes, you know, if you're out in the, out in the, the uh, flatlands of Kansas or somewhere, it's you know, more difficult, I think, to come up with uh, natural neighborhoods. Or Chicago. Um, it, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a judgment factor, and it's one of the judgment factors that we invite the public to challenge us on. You know, we, we try to do it because it makes it, it, it makes it fairer to come up with what is a standard in an area. And if we've misdefined that area, then, then the people should come in. And I've had that happen several times. And we've created sub neighborhoods just because of that. Yeah, I've seen gradients where a neighborhood will just, you know, that there's a, there's no dist a distinct thing at all. The neighborhood just gradually gets less valuable as it gets mm -hmm. closer to another neighborhood, or as it gets closer to, to where the smaller houses are. So the, you know, the mansions are at one end of the neighborhood, and and then the the fancy townhouses and then the, the smaller townhouses and so there's there's i i would think that used to be a big problem but that a computer should be able to chew that up um ed dodson says some years ago dan you that's uh, me you proposed that property owners be required to self-assess subject to the community having the right of first refusal to purchase the property of the assessed value plus something like 5%. Do I have that right? I always said self-assessment is, I always said the, the, the assessment the government gives you is a service to you so that you don't have to self-assess and that I have no problem with people holding vacant land uh, having to self-assess. And I would go further and say vacant land that is like if, if you have vacant land that you that you put to use you have like a big flea market there every saturday or something you have land that you're that you're demonstrably using then you should not have to self-assess because 
even though the even though the use you've established is not a physical improvement there's, there's a an intangible investment that you have and that you've advertised this location and um it it might not be it might just be a, a vacant lot with some asphalt but if you're fully using it you shouldn't have to assess you shouldn't have to pay what what anybody wants for it i wrote about the economic theory of self-assessment in my doctoral dissertation half a century ago and i have tried to uh, promote the idea from time to time and it always upsets people that they have to pay a higher tax just because they value the property more than the market and they're not willing to take the risk that it would be bought out from under them and so uh, I have been moving toward the idea of competitive assessment, which I will be talking about next week. Okay. Um, Wynn says, Delaware seems likely to finally reassess its three counties, um, which are using 1974, 1983, and 1987 assessments. Uh, what should I be looking for and speaking to? you're going to be seeing some enormous changes in value uh, for each of those three counties um, because values have changed dramatically from those time periods and I think the important thing is uh, that the that the uh, that the three counties do a good job of estimating the current market value and then does a good job of explaining what the changes were and why they've occurred and what the tax impact is going to be and I think that uh, it, it's going to be some large changes, but hopefully, as it works out, they won't need them. They should not need much more revenue, so that the uh, <clears throat> there'll be changes with many properties going up and many properties going down. But the net effect about, on the average property, they should be about where they were before the reassessments. Um, Josh Hahn wants to know how does rent control. Um, of a site with an apartment building affect its assessment? What can or needs to be considered in when there's rent control? I would say that rent control is a variation on the theme of zoning. It means yeah. you can't do what you otherwise, otherwise could do with the property. It lowers the market value. Uh, and it's important for the rent controlled property not to be treated uh, as if the rent control weren't there. Uh, it, it's even possible that a rent control property uh, is worth less than the vacant land would be worth because if you had vacant land you could do uh, something with it that wasn't constrained by the rent control. Uh, so uh, rent control is a device whereby uh, communities transfer wealth to tenants and uh, limit their ability to gather revenue from property tax. Yeah, and Josh was asking compared to other taxes, which taxes die first? I guess we we did talk about that. Um, although he wants to know which taxes fail to collect revenue first. And we partly talked about that and partly talked about which taxes would we choose to get rid of first. Um, and ju just in summary, the sales tax gets hit really hard because as sales go down, um, you, you, you lose that revenue. And wage taxes get hurt if you're, unless you're being paid wages. You know, you're not going to get that income tax. Yeah. Yeah. So the, it's, it's, it's the property taxes that will get collected. Um, very few jurisdictions are giving back ta in property taxes. So they'll be collected and they'll be the more stable of the taxes? Uh, I, I would say that changing a property tax to a land tax is perhaps the very first thing to do because yeah. it raises land values. That's it means right. you can use your land for better purposes without having to pay more. Yeah. Uh, so it, it, it's the, the, the tax reform that pays for itself. Um. Ed Dodson wants to know, Ted, if, if, if this is right, an apartment building has a potential sales value based on the net income stream generated 
and whether this income stream yields a competitive return compared to other types of investments. Factoring in some expectation of future increases permitted by increasing land values. Um, I don't know if I understood the whole question, but in, in essence, the um, the uh, 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 apartments are a fairly safe investment. Uh, of, of all commercial types of properties, it's the safest investment that there is. And as a result, the capitalization rate is lower on apartments than it is on other commercial type properties. So you already have in valuating apartments kind of um, higher values generated uh, th that kind of reflect the stability of apartments and the fact that they are such a good investment and that people want to live in apartments and so forth. Um, I, I didn't get the entire gist of this question. Um. I think it was very similar to when we talked about capitalization um, before and factoring in expectation of future increases. Um, and this, I wanted to be clear about, because there was some confusion about whether capitalization rate is higher or lower. You divide by the capitalization rate. So you're, you're making, the, mm -hmm. you're making the, the denominator lower. So if the capitalization rate is 5%, it means that the that the the capital value is 20 times the rental value or the net rent but if the capitalization rate is lower like it's four percent then it means it's 25 times the cap so when you say the capitalization rate is lower you're really saying the capital value compared to the rent is higher so i just wanted to in case anybody because i was confused about that and nick corrected me and i it took me a second to figure out that he was right because because he was go, go, going defining with, it differently than going I on with Ed's question a, a good appraiser and is looking at in an income stream over a long period of time not just this year and next year but like 10 years or 20 years and they're looking at what's going to happen and many of the appraisers see that over time um, certain kinds of properties like apartments are going to get uh, increase in value. The demands are going to go up and the stability of the income is there and they do a discounted cash flow maybe over a 10-year period looking at what it's worth today and looking at what it's worth 10 years from now and then what it's worth in all those in, in between periods. And there are, there are um, sophisticated computer programs that do this routinely for assessors that are required on bank appraisals we used to do them on apartments that uh, we'd have to project. And when we did land for um, a, a land valuation for a, a bank, again, you'd be looking at a, a long-term period, maybe a 10 or 20 year holding period. And you'd be looking at what it is today and what all the costs are gonna be going into it and what it's gonna be worth when it's done in 20 years. So I think that I, what I think he's suggesting is that an appraisal is not only looking at, at today's value, but it's looking at the expectation that people have in the future value. That's what people are buying. They're buying, they're buying not only the thing as it exists today, but what it's going to be like in the future. Um, Scott Baker asks, is it unusual to have large differences in assessments in a high-rise apartment building? Well, I guess that only means condos because for, for a rental unit, you just assess the whole building, right? Except you pay more rent uh, as you go up. You know, most people prefer higher levels. So they pay a higher price and a higher rent as the building goes higher. They don't okay. want to live, they don't want to live in the basement or, or the ground floor. They want to live on the top floor. Okay. If there's an elevator. If there's an elevator. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and if there's air conditioning. I, it's, right. I'm just thinking of living on the third floor of, mm -hmm. of an old house. Um, yeah, so the rent, that, but that's the assessment that the landlord does when he's figuring out what to charge his tenants. That's not... That's and that's the purchase the, price that people are willing to pay for. Yeah, it that's also, not the government assessor's thing. Um, this is... Um, what about the impact fees... 
to pay for necessary infrastructure and schools. Um, that's wins too, yeah. Well, I guess in, places in, that are curtailed their property tax resort yeah. to impact fees. Right. Impact fees have become very common, especially in California and all the other places where there are, um, in, you know, assessments are limited. Uh, they have to they have to f come up with methods of um, providing for education for the, the new students that are going to be arriving, and they have to provide, you know, uh, police service and fire service and community services. So if impact fees have become very common. And they get assessed in, in different ways. Typically, uh, they're looked at as what the cost of the new, um, the, the, the new services or the benefit that the new services are going to be uh, as this new land is developed. Uh, and they charge an impact fee based upon that benefit that's going to be received. In some cases, they want to actually get the cost of building a school if it's a large enough place, you know. Uh, so they might charge 50% uh, of the cost of a school if it's going to add 50% 50, 50 more students. And I think the other side of it, it is that if the assessor knows that there are going to be impact fees, he has to subtract the impact fees from the value of the property. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's true on assessing land also. Uh, that will uh, be an impact on land assessments if... Uh, if because the buyer of the land is going to be aware of all these impact fees, and he's going to, that's going to be a cost that he subtracts from what his final product. The buyer of the land is basically looking down the line, what he's going to sell those lots for, or what he's going to build and, 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 uh, and get out of the property in the future. But he has to look at all the costs along the way. And I did that, that, that one example of a subdivision, how there's all these hidden costs in building a subdivision of putting in streets and sewers and all these other kinds of things that have to go into it so that when you when you come up with it you come up with a much lower value for a piece of vacant land that is totally unimproved and does not have the utilities and the benefits of the community available to it and uh, that reduces the value of vacant land quite a bit that's undeveloped my first wife's brother built a house in California. We went out to visit him and the house was just being built. And uh, it had a bedroom and a kitchen and a huge, huge living room. And I said, why do you want a living room that big? And he said, because the, I, well, I forget whether it was Alameda or whatever. He said, they're charging an impact fee of $3,000 a room on new houses. <laughs> so after they've all left, I'll put up partitions. <laughs> um, Dev Preet just all wants to know, wants more information on the term resource proportional, Nick. Okay. Uh, what I mean by resource proportional is uh, elaborating on the idea that the earth belongs to all of us so that uh, we achieve justice if each of us has the same uh, value from the value of land provided by nature, uh, ch appropriate charges for carbon emissions, appropriate charges for taking fish out of the ocean, appropriate charges for removing minerals from the ground, all of those uh, appropriate charges for uh, use of natural opportunities ought to be divided equally among everybody on the earth. And so you are behaving in a resource proportional fashion if you ensure that to the extent that your uh, use of those natural opportunities, that to the extent that your use is greater than what everybody else can also have, you make a contribution to those who have less than their shares. Then you are behaving in a resource proportional fashion. So it's like the per capita dividend out of a land value tax, except it also applies to extractive and pollutive yes. um, operations. And you don't have to wait until we have governments that do it. You can do it on an individual basis. I was inspired in part by learning how slavery began to end in the 1700s 
when a couple of Quakers went around persuading other Quakers that they needed to free their slaves. Now, it's remarkable that Quakers didn't know this already, but they didn't. They had to be uh, lectured to it, explained that they needed to free their slaves. And a number of them did in response to this, these exhortations. So the way we began to get slavery ended was that people realized they needed to free their slaves. So it seems to me that similarly, we might get to the idea of equal sharing of natural opportunities by having individuals act in such a way as to make sure that they individually do not have more than their share. Ted, how, how many assessors are Georgists and why or why not? Um, I have found that many assessors understand the importance of land and the collection of land rent. Most of them don't see the need of doing away with building taxes, though. They understand the importance of collecting land rent, uh, but they, they, they kind of leave it there and say, well, uh, yeah, we have to collect the land rent. That makes sense from the fairness and equity and all the other you know, professional feelings that we have. But um, what's wrong with taxing buildings? The, the number that are really Georgists that want to do away with building taxes are much fewer, but I would say that it's at least, at, well, at least, I know it's in the hundreds. It may be even a thousand. We have like 9,000 assessing jurisdictions in the United States. And I've met assessors from all over. You know, we, we go to these conferences. The Lincoln Institute always has a uh, big uh, program on a big display. And land value taxation is all, often discussed at these conferences. And there's been even papers on land value taxation. So it's it's not like it's an unknown subject. It's just one that is kind of uh, not regarded as the the end thing to do in the real world. You know, we understand it, but we are, there's maybe in the hundreds that really want to become Georgists or that are Georgists. Okay. Taxpayer, I think that's Chuck Metallitz, but he, he asks, um, by what proportion might an assessing jurisdiction be able to reduce its its assessing costs if it is only required to, if it's only taxing land and not improvements? Well, I, I, I would say by 80% at least. Um, they still have to maintain the public records, but they would, ha they would do away with all the trouble and costs of going out and inspecting buildings every so often and uh, every time additions are made and changes are made. Uh, when, when you hire people to work in the field, most of the work is done by people going out doing those building inspections. And it's usually just one person in the office that really becomes the expert in land. And if you have an office of 20 people, you know, that's, that's 1 20th of the, uh, of the work uh, effort by that office. Um, I, I, but there is the public records and so forth that have to be maintained. Like we have to build, we have, we have to build the maps and build the computer systems and, and so forth. So you're not going to get away with 100%, but at least I would say 80% of your cost would be eliminated if you did not have to do buildings. Yeah, I, I'm guessing that some inspection of buildings is necessary just so your comparable sales, that you know what your comparable sales are, but, uh, but you don't have to assess every building. You just have to have enough to... You know, when they sell, you can say, okay, what, what condition was this sold in? Yeah, you don't have to inspect the buildings to do that. Uh, that that's, that's, that's much easier to do. We used to, uh, uh, we used to do a land residual analysis by looking at what the um, v value had been given to the uh, building in the prior assessment period and subtracting it to come up with a real fast land residual. So I, 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 I didn't been thinking about this in the past, and it's always a question that's been of interest to me. And I just have come up with 80%, and I'm going to stick with that number, I think. Okay. Reduce costs by 80%. When, when Ackenbaum wants to know, what is the standard, what, I, I put in standard, what is the depreciation rate? I've seen 1.5% asserted in Westport, Connecticut in 2003 was, or so, was using approximately that, but then Today, the, the, 
they're the teardown of the day and even 40 year old homes are obsolete. The, the rate of depreciation, again, will vary by different locations, different neighborhoods, different jurisdictions, different cities. So you can't come up with, with, with a number that's going to represent everything. I think that one and a half percent has been, you know, a figure that's been found to be a, a typical amount that uh, some assessors have used. Uh, but in many cases, um, like when, I, when we're doing a, uh, building assessments in Bridgeport, we didn't do uh, we didn't do a depreciation. What we simply did is a land valuation and a property valuation, and the residual was whatever was left was the building value. So we didn't have to bother with coming up with a depreciation rate because uh, it was whatever was left, and that works. That's the way, really. I think that most assessors should do it. They they come up with two assessment roles. One is of the land value. The other is of the total property value. And the difference is the building values. It's just whatever the depreciated building is, is the difference between the land value and the total and the market value of the sold improvement. Alan Ridley says the tax shift from improvements to land value tax should reduce the overall cost of homes. Is Pittsburgh the best example of how this worked? Are there others where we can point to British Columbia, Australia, Hong Kong, Taiwan? Um, well, Pittsburgh is a good example within the United States. So if you're talking to Americans, um, when we lost our land value tax and we're having our first bubble in a hundred years, but um, in, two, in 2008, when all the crashes were, we had the lowest foreclosure rate of any major United States city and we also had the lowest um, negative equity rate. So, um, you know, my argument, because people want affordable, people on the left want affordable housing, but people in business don't want to see the property values go down. My argument is that it keeps them stable and that what people want even more than appreciating values is stable values, that they don't want an appreciation that's all gonna be all air unless they're gonna sell and get out. So the people who are in, in Pittsburgh real estate for the long time, term, um, I've been able to convince them that some land value tax is good because it, it prevents these wild cycles that can throw everything off on them. I think that what we have is the problem is that our tax rates on on assessments are so low on land uh, that we're collecting but a small portion of the total land rental value. And until we increase that to a larger amount, we're not going to really see the building values uh, uh, drop. Uh, I know that when I did my study of California in 2010, I used a 4% tax rate on land and it produced enough revenue in California to replace all local taxes, income taxes, sales taxes, building taxes, and to have a citizen's dividend of, I, I believe it was $500 a month. So 4% four, four, four will get us there, you know. 4% yeah. would be a, a suitable land value tax. I think the actual tax could be higher than that. <clears throat> it, could be, it could be 6 or 7%. Could I add something here? Uh, one of the ideas that I have developed over the past 10 or 20 years uh, at the suggestion of uh, Michael Hudson is that if we're going to have a very large increase in land taxes, we should send the bill not to the title holder, but at least in part to the mortgage holder. When somebody uh, extends a mortgage and then goes to the courthouse and declares that the property can't be sold until his debt is satisfied. He's declaring himself to be the collector of the rent. And if you're the collector of the rent, you're the person to whom we ought to send the bill if we're going to collect the rent for public purposes. So anyway, I think that we shouldn't think of uh, the, the total bill going to the title holder if we have a sudden unanticipated large increase in uh, taxes on land. Yeah. And the usual way to avoid that is to 
make the increases gradual and, and predictable. Um, because if they're, I mean, predictable is just as important as gradual. If you, if you put something in your home rule charter that requires taxes to gradually shift to land value, that the knowledge of that will be capitalized into a price reduction or a price increase right on the spot, depending on whether that property is going to come out ahead. Um, but my only problem with sending the bill to the bank is quite often the bill already goes to the bank and the bank has a contract with the mortgagee. So you have to interfere with that contract between the, the, um, between the bank and the mortgagee that, that, um, Yes, uh, I believe that legislators have the power to levy taxes where they want to and to override existing contracts so that even if the contract says that the title holder will pay the increase in taxes, I believe that the legislature can say, no, that's not how we're going to do it in this case. A similar event uh, occurred in 1933 when Roosevelt uh, ended the possibility of owning gold and said that anybody who has a gold contract, gold clause in his contract is out of luck. A gold, gold contract, gold clauses in contracts will not be enforced. So there is precedent for the idea of saying we can uh, put uh, changes in uh, who has what into place without regard to existing contracts if we want to. Okay. Just two, two more examples. In Greenwich, Connecticut, 65% uh, of all the revenue from uh, real property came from land values. And I think that many people understood the importance of land value tax in Greenwich, Connecticut, even though we still value put values on the buildings. Uh, typically, the typical home, you know, would be, would be like 65% of it would be building, would be land value, and only 35% would be building value. And then I think also another bad example is in British Columbia. There, there we have the finest assessment system in the entire world, but we collect so little land revenue that the values are just going sky high because of the failure to collect land revenue. And if they collected just a, you know, a, a modest amount, like 1%, it would do something to at least keep the values more in line. Right now they're growing so high and the values are so high in, in that even though even though they average 50% of all the taxes in British Columbia are land values, but yet they, they amount, the percentage that's collected is so small that it doesn't bring down the housing costs. Okay. Um, Scott Baker wants to know, would there be property appreciation if 100% of the rent of the land value, I assume, was collected for the common good? Um, no. <laughs> I would think generally not. I mean, it, it would be like automobiles. Every once in a while, there's a unique automobile that sustains where all the other ones like it are gone. Yeah. Well, to the, if land sells for a noticeable price, it's evidence that the assessor hasn't quite done his job. If the assessor yeah. does his job right, the approximate price of every title for a vacant piece of land will be zero. Yeah. But buildings could theoretically appreciate in unusual circumstances. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, if the murder occurred there and people like the idea of living in a house where a murder occurred or want to turn <laughs> into a museum, you know. Yeah. Or if a, if a great and famous person lived there or something. Um, Ed Dodson, just a note about my experience as a mortgage investor. Appraisers would sometimes call me saying the mortgage company was pressuring him or her to come up to the sales price to make the deal work. I said, well, I'm not a regulator, but I can flag all the appraisal work you do for, for a review appraisal and make the mortgage company buy back the loan. The appraisers were in a sense caught behind between a rock and a hard place. <laughs> Yeah, I, I noticed that the pressure on appraisers is, you know, that there's a pressure, there's a pressure on government assessors that's political, but there's a pressure on appraisers too, because um, 
the property owner wants the appraisal to be high enough to justify the price he's trying to get a mortgage on. Um, Wynn says, what does the availability of broadband add to the value of a piece of land? In Southern Delaware, subdivisions are checkerboard and everyone thinks all are entitled to broadband. I would think it would add value. At the very least, it would add some, like if 80% of the people are paying for cable TV, and cable TV is $100 a month, then, my neighborhood then $80 got, a month would be a great deal. My neighborhood got broadband a few years ago, and it was claimed that it would add $10,000 to the value of the properties. As property assessments are concerned with assessing the selling price, is there a reason we don't use the annual rental value of the properties in said, instead? Seems like the rental value assessment would be unaffected by the mortgage interest rate or the capital, capitalization rate of the day. My guess that it depends on what market data is available, sales data versus rent data. Um, that's from About Joshua. right. Yep. Um, it strikes me that if we did move to a land value tax and to assessing rental value that we would <clears throat> start collecting lease. You know, we collect, we collect, um, we collect the, the data. When you sell a house, the government gets a copy of the, of the sales price. But we could have something that says, if you have, a, if you, if you are a landlord and you offer a lease and you want that lease to be enforceable on your tenant, you have to register that lease as well. And then we would have lots of rental data. I don't know if that's necessary or, well, or useful. It's, it, it's still difficult to figure out what the rental value is of unimproved land when all the uses of the land uh, involve improvements. I spent many years trying to figure out exactly what was meant by the rental value of land. And I finally came up with the, fi with the following formula, that if you have a vacant piece of land and you have some idea how to use it, and somebody says, wait, I want to use it for X for one year, could you delay your use of the land for one year? And how much it costs you in your plans to postpone things for one year is the rental value of the land for this year. Mm -hmm. But it's very difficult to turn that into a market observation. Okay. Um, if property is assessed by comparing properties to its current use, residential, commercial, et cetera, does this interfere with the genuine highest best use assessment? Do any assessment methods mix properties across uses? That's from Lee Hatchadorian again. Well, again, I would say that the assessors always look at the highest and best use of the property, not the actual use. And they look at what the highest and best use of a property would be. And oftentimes it may be different than the actual use. So um, we, we, we look at the income that would come from the highest and best use, not the actual use, and the expenses that would come from the highest and best use. So I think that assessors generally are already doing this, or at least they should be. That's the, the proper way of valuing a property either as an appraiser or as an assessor. Okay, I think we're almost done. Um, the Realtors Association collects enormous amounts of data, but it's mostly proprietary. What chance is there to get those laws changed? Um, I think it's proprietary, but it's not expensive to subscribe to it. I think most assessors will buy an account from the Realtors Association and have that have access to that data. I'm not certain. Yeah, but, yeah, not, most, of, most of it now is free online. Uh, the real estate boards publish their uh, sales information and properties for rent and so forth. So I think assessors already have most of this information available free of charge. Certainly when a property is sold, that, that's a, a, 
a, a, that is recorded in a document that the assessors get a copy of. The assessors get a copy of every sale document that occurs. So, you know, we already have, I think, our hands on the best information that's available. Yeah. Um, I, you know, we could ask for more, but I, I think we're getting enough. I, did, I was an old friend of a Pittsburgh assessor, and she, she said that she looks at the listings. Um, yep. Even if there's no comparable sales, she looks at the listings and discounts them a little bit on the assumption that, that most of the people will come down in price if they have to. Um, Ed Dodson said, I recall that some economists argue that an owner-occupied residential property yields to the owner an imputed income because the owner does not have to pay a landlord. There is, they argue, a taxable income based on the difference between the monthly cost of ownership and the monthly cost of renting the same housing unit. Am I recalling correctly? I would put it differently. What I would say is that the economic position is that owning anything involves receiving an implicit income equal to the value of having that access. And it doesn't have anything to do with rental. It's just that uh, anything you own uh, that uh, you're not renting out to somebody else that you're, you're using yourself gives you an implicit income uh, approximately equal to what you would pay to rent it. Yeah, and there there are some differences because your relationship as a renter is not the same as your relationship as an owner. So, yes. so as as an owner, you have more control over the property, and you also have more responsibility for the property. Mm -hmm. um, and our last question: um, Is there any de evidence that more highly taxed property, uh, and thus and thus lower priced, is more sought after by buyers? I think that at the right price, you can sell anything. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, I would. Okay, so there, yeah. there is this difference that Mason Gaffney has pointed out. And that is that as you increase the taxes, you uh, tend to attract buyers with lower incomes. Uh, if you have a low taxes and high price property, it tends to be relatively more attractive to rich people, whereas high taxed, and lower value property is relatively more attractive to poor people. Yeah, and and the um, the the effect on on supply might be stronger than the effect on demand. That the you know if if the tax on uh, buildings or wages is lower, then that increases somebody's willingness to buy a property there. But a tax on, an increased tax on land really motivates the heck out of somebody sitting on a vacant or grossly underused lot. So my understanding is from Australia, the studies that were done in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, because they, they went from straight property tax to straight land value tax uh, by referendum. So it was a, a, an, a relatively abrupt shift. And my understanding is that um, land prices fell for the first couple, two or three years, and then they recovered and, and um, actually became higher because the, the market response was so dynamic that more housing was being built and, and the economic vitality of that area improved so that the land prices recovered and actually surpassed the prices of the places that were staying with property tax. So, and Ed Dodson says, thanks, enjoyed this immensely. So does anybody have any kind of concluding things to say? And then we will put this well, to I, 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 I thank you for your, your, your interest in this subject. And I think that you uh, have come to realize that uh, um, in the assessing world, there's a lot of judgment that takes place. And there's a, a lot of... Um, use of computers, but there's still a lot of uh, effort that has to be put in and thought that has to be put in in doing an assessment. And we see the different qualities across the country. I think some, you know, some states and jurisdictions do really good jobs and other ones do more mediocre jobs. And I think that in our, as Georgia's, we're interested in seeing assessments done properly. And whenever we can kind of 
foster getting the assessments done properly, we should do that. Please remember to join us next week for Nick. Uh, the codes will be the same as what you use uh, today, and they will be broke. We will send reminders out next Tuesday. So uh, do join us for that. Okay. And in closing, I want to once again say that, uh, that um, this is all made possible by uh, primarily support from the Robert Schockenbach Foundation and also from the Foundation for Economic Justice, the Henry George Institute, Common Ground USA, and private donors. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>